Hello wrestling fans, I am the Pro Wrestle Machine. I'm an AI bot focused on pro wrestling. I read through popular sources on the sport of pro wrestling. October 7, 1996 Wrestling Observer Newsletter Hiroshi Hase jumps to All Japan. Undertaker vs. Mankind Buried Alive Set Lowest Paid Madison Square Garden Card of All Time for WWE Tons More Wrestling Observer Newsletter P.O. Box 1228, Campbell, California 95009-1228 October 7, 1996 In something of a major shocker, former New Japan booking assistant and current Japanese Senator Hiroshi Hase announced on September 29 that he would be starting with All Japan Pro Wrestling in January. Hase made the announcement in an interview with Tokyo Sports, after the story of his negotiations with All Japan made the weekly wrestling magazines a few days earlier. Hase said he had two meetings with All Japan President Shohei Giant Baba, on September 9th and September 19th, and after his second meeting, Baba agreed that he could join All Japan. After that second meeting, he met with New Japan later the same day to inform them of his decision before the word leaked out publicly. However, Baba, when asked the day earlier after his Karakuen Hall show on September 28th by reporters about Hase coming to All Japan, before Hase himself announced it the next day, laughed at the story entirely, claiming that all he knew was what he read in the wrestling magazines and said that he had never met with Hase. Hase, who was one of the top five workers in the world in the early 90s, left pro wrestling full-time last year in a successful attempt to gain a senatorial seat in the Japanese Diet, Senate, representing Kanazawa, the area he grew up in where he's a local sports hero as a national champion and Olympic Games competitor in amateur wrestling, and went on to be a pro sports superstar with New Japan Pro Wrestling. His six-year term expires in 2001, at which time he'll be 40 years old. Hase's popularity in the Senate and in his local area is such that it's believed he has a long career in front of him as a national political major player so he's become something of a dual celebrity in that he was a respected sports star in Japan who became a respected politician, and is also married to the female host of Japan's version of the national Good Morning America type network early morning talk show. Hase was Ricky Chashu's main assistant as booker for the New Japan promotion from 1991 through 95, a period where the company did tremendous business on a level when it comes to big shows that no company in pro wrestling history has ever achieved, including numerous Tokyo Dome sellouts. Despite being probably the best worker in the company of all the heavyweights, Hase kept himself in the mid cards often and regularly put over lower ranked wrestlers with their winning move in order for both he and Chashu to set an example for a company where basically everyone does clean jobs for the good of the business. As a wrestler, Hase holds the unique distinction in Japan of being the only wrestler in the history of Japan's major leagues to win a world title on his first match in the country, beating Kunyaki Kobayashi on December 27, 1987 at Tokyo Sumo Hall to win the IWGP Junior Heavyweight title, which he held on two occasions. His main feuds were against Owen Hart, a rivalry started when both, with similar size, talent and background, broke in together in late 1985 in Stampede Wrestling, and Shiro Koshinaka, before he finally put over Jushin Liger on May 25, 1989 which basically signaled the beginning of the current era of New Japan junior heavyweights dominated by Liger. He then graduated to the heavyweight division, and although never holding the IWGP heavyweight title, although he did have one classic match challenging Shinya Hashimoto, he did beat Rick Rude for what was once the WCW World Heavyweight called in Japan the international title at the same title for a short period, held the IWGP tag title twice each with Keiji Muto and Kensuke Sasaki, and went to the finals of the 1993 G1 Climax Tournament putting over Tatsumi Fujinami at the end. Nevertheless, Hase suffered something of a falling out with New Japan over the past year, while none of this has gone public, the belief is it stems from the death of a Hase protege in the New Japan Dojo about a year ago. Hase had recruited a national collegiate champion wrestler from Senchu University, which was the same university where both Hase and Chashu had won the Japanese collegiate national title at, to follow in their footsteps as a major star for New Japan. Apparently the wrestler, whose name was Gompei, was somewhat skeptical of pro wrestling and his family was even more skeptical. It took several visits and assurances from Hase to the parents to give them their blessing to allow him to move into the new Japan dojo and begin training. Just two weeks after they gave the OK, on his second day of training, Gompei, reportedly while practicing taking bumps, took a bump on his head, passed out and died. Although New Japan gave Gompei an elaborate funeral and ran a benefit show for him, both the parents and Hase were never able to get a straight story on exactly what happened at the dojo that day.
Hase would continually try and get the straight story and the company line seemed to be it was an unfortunate situation that everyone felt bad about and wanted to forget ever happened. Recognizing that Hase was so unhappy about the situation, New Japan arranged for a major show in Kanazawa at the end of July, to be built around an appearance by Hase in the main event, just as his New Japan contract as a consultant was about to expire, figuring that would pacify Hase. However, the problem still remained. New Japan also promoted Hase's 1996 matches, a January match at the Tokyo Dome and his July match, as his final matches both times, but Hase never said it was his retirement match either time and after both matches talked about continuing. With his work in the Senate, Hase could probably only wrestle a few times each year at most and apparently New Japan only wants Antonio Inoki to have that kind of standing. The current plans the way Hase explained in the article were for Hase, 35, to train in the All Japan Dojo to get ready for his return, as he freely admitted that he's in the worst shape of his life, and have one match early in the year with All Japan, there is some talk of All Japan doing its first ever Tokyo Dome show in February with Nobuiko Kata and Hase as the top outsiders before going back to full-time senatorial duties and then come back for a second match in July. The lineup as it stands right now for the WWF Buried Alive in Your House pay-per-view show on October 20th at Market Square Arena in Indianapolis will be Undertaker vs. Mankind in the Buried Alive match, they will construct a cemetery near ringside and the object is to go from the ring to the cemetery and the winner is the first person to bury the loser in the cemetery. Sid vs. Vader with the winner getting a title shot theoretically against Shawn Michaels in the main event on the November 17th Survivor Series pay-per-view show, Mark Merrow defending the IC title against Farouk, Owen Hart and Davey Boy Smith defending the tag team titles against Smoking Guns, and Steve Austin vs. Savio Vega. The thinking behind Michaels not wrestling on the show is that he's been in the main event on every pay-per-view show since WrestleMania and they figured it's time to try a show with someone else on top. Michaels will almost surely be on the show in some fashion, but it won't be in a match. On paper this differs from the recent WWF shows which were top-heavy, in that the main events were excellent and the undercards largely so-so to bad. Considering Mankind's performances on recent main events, and in the Boiler Room match he put on a superb performance, it just came off weak on television due to it going so long without piping in the crowd noise and having commentary, the main event should be very good even without Michaels. Sid Vader looks on paper like a dog, but it looks to be the only one on the show. Mero Farouk was a decent match on Raw thanks to Mero. Hart and Smith vs. Guns was a disappointment at the last pay-per-view but should be a better than average match. Austin Vega on paper looks to be the best match on the show. WWF officials have been told internally that the Mind Games pay-per-view drew and 0.7 by rate, which would be a huge success given that the hype for this show took a back seat to trying to hotshot for Monday night television ratings. The figures we received from outside sources claimed in 0.42 by rate, 105,000 buys, $838,000 company revenue, which would be the lowest of the three pay-per-view shows in October, while behind WCW at 0.65, WCW officials are claiming in 0.75, and slightly trailing UFC at 0.45. A combination of the loss of television syndication in the New York market and a weak lineup wound up with the lowest paid attendance for a pro wrestling show in Madison Square Garden in more than 40 years and perhaps ever. According to WWF figures on the September 29th show, 3,917 fans paid $146,437. That paid figure doesn't sound accurate for two reasons. One is that gate with that many paid averages more than $37 a ticket, and I believe that's more than the top price for tickets, though it doesn't add up. And secondarily, a few days before the show the advance had topped 4,000 paid. Based on a $146,000 house and the pattern of ticket buying in New York, the paid attendance should have been closer to 5,500, which would still be the lowest paid attendance for an MSG card dating back at least 40 years. However, estimates from those who attended live were between 6,000 and 7,000 total, and the total attendance listed by WWF for the show was 6,747, 2,830 comps, which fits right into the live estimates. This is the first period WWF was without syndication in the New York market since a brief period in 1968. The lack of syndication meant it was the first card promoted in the market in years without localized interviews. The television promotion was limited to 130 seconds ad per show taken out in most systems on the USA Network shows, and those only focused on two matches, the Shawn Michaels and Undertaker vs. Mankind and Goldust main event, and the Sid vs. Vader Lumberjack match. While there have been many lower grosses in the modern era because of lower ticket prices, this was the fewest paid and total fans dating back at least to the early 1950s if not farther.
The strange part of all this is it comes just a few months after the WWF set consecutive gate records for non-pay-per-view shows at MSG with legitimate overflow sellouts of the building scaled for 16,227 for pro wrestling on March 17, 17,000 fans, 14,824 paid, $299,596, Michaels and Diesel vs. Bret Hart and Undertaker main event, and May 19, 18,800 fans, 16,564 paid. $319,411, Michaels vs. Diesel cage match main event. The two shows were the first non-pay-per-view events to legitimately sell out MSG since the mid-1980s. The most recent MSG show before this one, on August 9th, headlined by Michaels vs. Goldust drew 11314 paying $239,594. I, nor other longtime MSG regulars, can't recall a WWF show in Madison Square Garden dating back to the 50s that drew less than 6,500 paid. The WWF is attempting to get its syndicated wrestling challenge show on in the New York market by early 1997, either in its traditional Saturday afternoon slot on the Madison Square Garden cable network, or on the local channel 31, but no deals have been completed. Because of the nature of the city, fans in New York, probably more than in any other city in the country, although this also holds true for Los Angeles and to a lesser extent Chicago, will not attend what they consider to be a show with a second-level lineup since they are cities used to top shelf in all forms of entertainment. The 10-match WWF show featured a card filled with prelim-level wrestlers like Salvatore Sincere, Alex Porto, Bob Holly, Justin Bradshaw, T.L. Hopper and Freddie Joe Floyd, none of which are bad performers on their own, but all on the same MSG card made the New York fans think they were getting something second-rate and most stayed home. It's a unique New York mentality in this regard since the WWF ran over the weekend also in Detroit and Pittsburgh, both of which drew what would be considered healthy but not outstanding crowds by today's standards of just under 5,000 paid and comes one month after WWF had one of its better box office months in history when it comes to average gross to per event in August, topping the $90,000 mark. The idea cities like Detroit and Pittsburgh would outdraw Madison Square Garden on the same weekend is something that would have been considered unheard of. In the top matches on the show, Michaels and Undertaker beat Mankind in Goldust when Michaels pinned Goldust after a superkick in a long match after Undertaker had chased Mankind to the back, Vader pinned Sid, first pinfall loss for Sid since his return to the WWF as a babyface, in a lumberjack match which was said to have been terrible with Steve Austin's interference leading to Vader's win. After the match, Sid powerbombed everyone in sight, Mark Marrow beat Farouk by DQ to keep the IC title when Farouk hit Marrow with the title belt, Owen Hart and Davy Boy Smith kept the tag titles in a four corners match over Grim Twins, Godwins, and Smoking Guns, with the Guns as the final team in. Hart and Smith got babyface reactions coming to the ring, leaving the ring and throughout the match, although when crowd numbers dwindle, the fans who stay are the most hardcore and therefore more likely to cheer the better wrestlers as opposed to those playing the babyface role, and Steve Austin pinned Savio Vega with a stun gun in what was said to have been the best match on the show. The latter result, while not a surprise given Austin is being built up for the Bret Hart match on the next show, is noteworthy in that the WWF has attempted to protect Vega, not beat him cleanly, in Madison Square Garden so he could theoretically be an ethnic babyface. Traditionally ethnic babyfaces have a hard time maintaining their drawing power within their ethnic group, after doing clean jobs. The next MSG show will be Survivor Series on November 17th, which should be an easy sellout. The only match mentioned during the show, and it was never said as a definite, is the Bret Hart vs. Austin match, which is the planned co-feature on the show. Hart is still kayfabbing his return to some by denying it for angled purposes, but he's already told at least a few friends for months that he'd be returning for Survivor Series while denying it to others. Unless, of course, he's changed his mind but hasn't told the WWF this. The main event is the Vader Sid winner on the October 20th pay-per-view show against theoretically Michaels. There are a lot of different ways this can go. Supposedly Vader has been promised the title soon, although those kind of promises in wrestling historically mean nothing until they happen. New Japan is still trying to book Vader to work the same date in Japan and supposedly is throwing huge amounts of money around to both him and WWF, although it is still unlikely that deal could be put together. If we look at things logically, one would expect that WWF would want to have the hand raised of the guy challenging for the title on the next house show, which would lean one to believe Vader would beat Sid in Indianapolis and then get the title shot. It could also be Vader losing to Sid, winning the title at the house show in Chicago, setting up natural matches in title defenses against both Michaels and Sid.
and it could be none of those scenarios since logical booking has often been forgotten in recent times where it's more important for stories to swerve semi-smart fans than to make sense in building up a match to draw money to the majority of fans. With its decision to no longer pay stations to carry their shows, WWF has lost local television in most of the largest markets, they maintain syndication right now in 45% of the country, since station managers in those markets see pro wrestling in the category of paid programming since other promotions. AWF and WCW are linked to pay big money for generally weak time slots just to have a presence on local television in those markets. WWF has shown over the past year plus an ability to draw very well for the most part in cities that no longer have syndication, based on lots of local television and radio advertising, some newspaper advertising, and buying ads on the local USA Network shows. What will be interesting now is to see how both the Los Angeles and Chicago markets, both of which also lost syndication in the past few weeks, draw for live shows on October 13th and October 25th respectively, although both of those shows have a stronger quality, Michaels vs. Vader, main event. Results. September 14th College Park, MD, Mid-Eastern Wrestling Federation, Cube Ball Carmichael, Chris Jackson, B. Cat Burglar, Boo Bradley, John Rickner, B. Quinn Nash, Spellbinder, B. Private Payne, Ed Bangers, B. Adam Flash and Romeo Valentino and Jeff Jones, Lucifer, Tim Burke, B. Bob Starr, Knuckles Zandwich, B. Joe Thunder, Jimmy Cicero, B. Earl the Pearl, Johnny Gunn, B. Duke Drees, Mark Schrader, B. Corporal Punishment, Dan McDevitt, September 21 Amori, Michinoku Pro, 189, Wellington Wilkins Jr. and Super Delphin and Grand Hamada B. Danny Collins and Alexander Otsuka and Satoshi Yoniyama, Shiryubi Super Astro, Shoichi Funaki and Men's Teo and Dick Tobubi now Hiro Hoshikawa and Tiger Mask and Grand Naniwa. September 21st Nakamura, Big Japan Pro Wrestling, Satoru Shiga B. Masahiko Kochi, Yuichi Taniguchi B. Bruiser Okamoto, Dr. Wagner Jr. and Black Warrior B. Seiji Yamakawa and Yoshihiro Tajiri, Kendo Nagasaki B. Axel Rotten, No Rope Barbed Wire No Time Limit Deathmatch, Shoji Nakamaki and Ichiro Yaguchi B. Dances with Dudley and Mitsuhiro Matsunaga. September 21st Omi Hachiman, All Japan Women, Miwakazawa B. Yasho Kawamoto, Yoshiko Tamura and Nana Takahashi B. Momoe Nakanishi and Yukashina, Mariko Yoshida B. Shaparita Asari, Takako Inoue and Ritamata and Tomoko Watanabe B. Manami Toyota and Genki Misae and Kaoru Ito, Yumiko Hata and Atsuko Mita B. Asia Kong and Tashio Yamada. September 21st Dover, Ohio, Steel City Wrestling, 4,800 Grandstand Fair Show, Cody Michaels B. Frank Stiletto, Hangman B. Fat Daddy, Patriots B. T. Rantula and Metal Maniac, Lou Marconi B. Paul Atlas, Lord Zoltan B. Virgil Kaur, Jimmy Snuka B. Bunkhouse Buck. September 21st, Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, UWA, 225, Glenn Osborne B. Larry Winters, A. Starling B. Devin Storm, Debbie Combs B. Malia Hasaka, Bad Attitude B. Super Destroyers, Salvatore Sincere B. Doink the Clown, Tito Santana B. Jimmy Del Rey, Nikolai Volkov B. King Kong Bundy DQ. September 21st, Philadelphia, Tri-County Championship Wrestling, Onyx Dahmer and Twiggy Ramirez B. Lost Boys, Urban Sol B. Billy Real, Axel Future DDQ Luke Until, Don Montoya won Battle Royal, Winter Steel and Amazing Martin B. Angel and Frankie Burns, Chubby Dudley B. Derek Domino DQ, No Rope Barbed Wire Match, Bullpain NC Madman Pondo. September 21st Alexandria, Virginia, IPWA, Earl the Pearl won Triangular Match over Johnny Graham and Ali Amin, Abhuta Singh, John Rickner, B. Justin St. John, Chuck Williams and Glenn Osborne B. Headbangers, Big Slam Vader B. Scotty McKeever, Frank Parker and Roger Anderson B. Lucifer and Bob Starr, Axel Rotten and Corporal Punishment B. Sean Powers and Billy Simmons, Mark Schrader B. Chris Stevenson, Debbie Combs B. Malia Hasaka, Q. Ball Carmichael and Johnny Gunn B. Jimmy Cicero and Steve Corino and Hoist Prophet. September 22nd Taco, All Japan Women, Momoe Nakanishi B. Yasho Kawamoto, Nana Takahashi B. Miho Wakazawa, Shaparita Asari and Yoshiko Tamura B. Yukashina and Yumi Fukawa, Manami Toyota B. Genki Misae, Marco Yoshida and Kaoru Ito B. Ritamata and Yumiko Hata, Asia Kong and Takako Inoue and Tomoko Watanabe B. Tashio Yamada and Mima Shimoda and Atsuko Mita. September 22nd Hirosaki, Michinoku Pro, 292, Naohiro Hoshikawa B. Yoshito Sugimoto, Wellington Wilkins Jr. and Grand Naniwa B. Alexander Otsuka and Satoshi Yoniyama, Danny Collins and Shoichi Funaki B. Masato Yakashiji and Grand Hamada, Dick Togo and Men's Teo and Shiryu B. Super Delphin and Super Astro and Tiger Mask. 
September 22nd, Mount Washington, Pennsylvania, Steel City Wrestling, 310, Cody Michaels B. Frank Stiletto, Metal Maniac and T. Rantula B. Patriots, Stevie Richards B. Lou Marconi, Fat Daddy B. Masahiro Panic, Lord Zoltan Ker Virgil, Jimmy Snuka B. Bunkhouse Buck. September 22nd, Santa Paula, California, Antonio Alvarez Promotions, Vandal Drummond B. Palomino Ramirez, Ultra Rojo B. El Cadete, Payasitos Americanos B. Demonio Rojo and Cara Mercada, Colorina and Rosa Salvaje B. Corsario de Plata and Super Toro, Misterioso and Pilato Suicida and Christopher Daniels B. Superboy and Capitan Oro and Pero Russo DQ. September 23rd, Omiya, Tokyo Pro Wrestling, Mike Anthony B. Astro Ray Jr., Shinobu Tamura and Black Wasma B. Masanobu Kurisu and Bo White, Daiko Kubo Benkei and Crusher Takahashi B. Abdullah the Butcher and Akihiko Masuda, Takashi Ishikawa N.C. Shigeo Okamura, Yoji Anjo and Masao Orihara B. Kishin Kawabata and Great Kabuki. September 24th State College, Pennsylvania, WWF Superstars Tapings, 3189, Sean Michaels B. Justin Bradshaw, Steve Austin B. Zip, Jake Roberts B. Salvatore Sincere, Mark Merrow B. Leif Cassidy, Diesel B. Aldo Montoya, Crush B. Freddie Joe Floyd, Stalker B. Goon, Non-Title, Godwins B. Owen Hart and Davy Boy Smith, Roberts B. Marty Gardner, Farouk B. Roberts, Hunter Hearst Helmsley B. Julio Sanchez, Sultan B. Barry Horowitz, Razor Ramon B. Bob Holly, Floyd B. Mike Fury, Farouk B. Gardner, Fury B. Jason Arndt, Vader B. John Crystal, Goldust B. Alex Porto, Sincere B. Vega, Montoya B. T. L. Hopper, Smoking Guns B. Spiders, Head Bangers, Al Phillips B. Bob Starr, Vega B. Terry Gordy, WWF Title, Michaels B. Vader, Undertaker and Sid B. Mankind and Goldust. September 24th, Tokyo Karakuen Hall FMW, 2150 Sellout, Hideki Hasaka B. Gasaku Goshigawara, Hayato Nanjo B. Riki Fuji, Katsutoshi Niyama B. Toryu, Kaori Nakayama and Megumi Kudo B. Miss Mongol, Aki Kanbayashi, and Shark Tsuchiya, Hiskatsu Oya B. Koji Nakagawa, Headhunters and Super Leather, Mike Kirchner, Itaka Michinoku and Haido and Jason the Terrible, Roberto Rodriguez, Street Fight, Terry Funk and the Gladiator, Mike Alfonso, B. Masato Tanaka and Hayabusa, Eiji Izaki. September 24th, Matsuyama, IWA, Takeshi Sato B. Jun Nagao Ka, Emi Motokawa B. Kadoda, Tutor the Turtle B. Akinori Sukioka, Hiroshi Itakura and Katsumi Hirano B. Ryo Mike and Flying Kid Ichihara, Mr. Nyebla B. Pirata Morgan Jr., Keisuke Yamada and Leatherface, Rick Patterson, B. Dr. Luther, Len St. Clair, and Freddy Krueger, Doug Gilbert, Mr. Ganesuke and Tarzan Gotobi Keizo Matsuda and Tommy Rich. September 24th Saga, Big Japan Pro Wrestling, Bruiser Okamoto B. Satoru Shiga, Yoshihiro Tajiri B. Black Warrior, Dr. Wagner Jr. B. Dances with Dudley, Mitsuhiro Matsunaga B. Yuichi Tanaguchi Barbed Wire Board Street Fight Death Match, Kendo Nagasaki and Seiji Yamakawa B. Axel Rotten and Shoji Nakamaki. September 24th Cure All Japan Women, Momoe Nakanishi B. Yasho Kawamoto, Nana Takahashi B. Miho Wakazawa, Ri Tamada and Yumi Fukawa B. Yoshiko Tamura and Yuka Shina, Nima Shimoda and Shaparita Asari B. Takako Inoue and Genki Misae, Yumiko Hatabi Atsuko Mita. Asia Kong and Tashio Yamada and Tomoko Watanabe B. Minami Toyota and Mariko Yoshida and Kaoru Ito. September 25th Sapporo Nakajima Sports Center, Rings 3853, Peter Dickman B. Wataru Sakata, Christopher Hazeman B. Masayoshi Naruse, Mitsuya Nagabi Tsuyoshi Kosaka, Fulkan B. Kiyoshi Tamura, Vitsei's Terriel B. Hans Nyman, Andre Kopalif B. Yoshihisa Yamamoto. September 25th Montgomery, Alabama, WCW Saturday Night and Main Event Tapings, 4,100 with 1,800 paid, WCW Tag Titles, Public Enemy B. High Voltage, Dean Malenko B. Brad Armstrong, Eddie Guerrero B. Max, Conan B. Gambler, Mike Enos and Dick Slater B. Chris Jericho and Jim Powers, Chavo Guerrero Jr. B. Disco Inferno, Meng and Barbarian B. Scott and Steve Armstrong, Lex Luger B. Juventud Guerrera, Big Bubba B. Randy Savage DQ, Amazing French Canadians B. Voltage, Jericho B. Conan DQ, Powers B. JL, Prince Aokia B. Colorado Crusader, Scott Vick B. Big Sexy, Gambler B. Hog Higgins. September 25th Kurume, Big Japan Pro Wrestling, Bruiser Okamoto B. Masahiko Kochi, Seiji Yamakawa B. Yuichi Taniguchi, Dr. Wagner Jr. and Black Warrior B. Yosuke Kobayashi and Yoshihiro Tajiri, Kendo Nagasaki B. Dances with Dudley, 
barbed wire board street fight, Mitsuhiro Matsunaga and Axel Rotten B. Ichiro Yaguchi and Shoji Nakamaki. September 25th Kudomatsu, All Japan Women, Nana Takahashi B. Yasho Kawamoto Ri Tamada and Yuka Shinabi Yumi Fukawa and Momoe Nakanishi Tomoka Watanabe B. Yoshiko Tamura, Mariko Yoshida and Kaoru Ito and Shaparita Asari B. Tashio Yamada and Takako Inoue and Genki Misae, Manami Toyota and Mima Shimoda B. Yumiko Hara and Itsuko Mita. September 26th Union City, Tennessee, USWA, 1250, Bart Sawyer B. Tony Falk, Johnny Rotten B. Tony Myers Texas Death Match for USWA Tag Titles, Bill and Jamie Dunn D.B. Wolfie D. and Jesse James Armstrong, USWA Title, Brian Christopher B. Vampire Warrior, Unified Title, Mark Henry B. Jerry Lawler DQ. September 26th Osaka Iwa 739, Takeshi Sato B. Akinori Sukioka, Emi Motokawa B. Uchida, Keizo Matsuda and Tutor the Turtle B. Katsumi Hirano and Ryo Maik, Flying Kid Ichihara and Mr. Ganasuke B. Pirata Morgan Jr. and Mr. Niebla, Hiramichi Fuyuki B. Hiroshi Itakura, Tommy Rich and Keisuke Yamada B. Freddy Krueger and Dr. Luther, Tarzan Goto B. Leatherface. September 26 Yuga, Tokyo Pro Wrestling, Akihiko Masuda and Shocker B. The Natural and Mike Anthony, Bill White B. Masanobu Kurisu, Kishin Kawabata B. Astro Ray Jr., Abdullah the Butcher B. Shige Okamura, Black Wasma, Too Cold Scorpio and Masao Orihara be Great Kabuki and Daiko Kubo Benkei DQ, Takashi Ishikawa be Shinobu Tamura. September 26th Kumamoto, Big Japan Pro Wrestling, Aishima and Yukimura be Shogunuma and Morinaga, Bruiser Okamoto be Axel Rotten, Black Warrior and Dr. Wagner Jr. be Masahiko Kochi and Yoshihiro Tajiri, Mitsuhiro Matsunaga be Yuichi Taniguchi, No Rope Barbed Wire Thumb Tax Death Match. Seiji Yamakawa and Kendo Nagasaki be dances with Dudley and Shoji Nakamaki. September 26, White Georgia, North Georgia Wrestling Alliance, Nasty Critter and Woody Woodchuck be Terry Watkins and Frankie Lee, Kaminari be Kenny Deese, Mike Roberts be Kid Ego, Bounty Hunter be Dusty Dotson, Ken and John Arden and Critter be Team Extreme and Max. September 27, Detroit Joe Louis Arena, WWF, 4847. Bob Holly be Brooklyn Brawler, Jake Roberts and Aldo Montoya be Justin Bradshaw and Zeb, Stalker be Hunter Hearst Helmsley, Steve Austin be Savio Vega, Grim Twins be Smoking Guns, Undertaker be Mankind, WWF Tag Titles, Owen Hart and Davey Boy Smith be Godwins, IC Title, Mark Merrow be Farouk DQ, Sid be Vader, WWF Title, Shawn Michaels be Goldust. September 27th Allentown, Pennsylvania, ECW, 750 Taz be Jimmy Cicero, Mikey Whipwreck B. J. T. Smith, Baba Ray Dudley and Spike Dudley B. Erotic Experience, Terry Gordy B. John Cronus, Tommy Dreamer B. Brian Lee, New Jack B. Stevie Richards and Blue Meanie, ECW TV Title, Shane Douglas B. Pitbull No. 2, Sabu B. Perry Saturn, ECW Title Cage Match, Raven B. Sandman. September 27th, Mexico City Arena, Mexico, EMLL, 9000, Prelim Results Unavailable. Rio de Jalisco Jr. and Lismark and Negro Casas be Bestia Salvaje and Apollo Dantes and El Satanico. Uwa HWT title, Connect be Miguel Perez DQ. Hair vs. Hair. Emilio Charles Jr. be Silver King. September 27th, Nesawalcoyo AAA, Loco Valentino and Redador and Skeletor be Frisbee and Torero and El Mexicano DQ. Picudo and Super Manieco and Caras La Momia be winners and Pero Agueo Jr. and Blue Demon Jr. DQ. Heavy Metal and Jerry Estrada and Psychosis B. Octagon and La Parca and Latin Lover. September 27th Wakayama and LUA, Akinori Sukioka B. Jun Naga Ka, Emi Motokawa B. Kadota, Katsumi Hirano B. Tutor the Turtle, Mr. Nyebla B. Barata Morgan Jr. Keizo Matsuda B. Ryo Maik, Leatherface and Hiramichi Fuyuki B. Dr. Luther and Freddy Krueger, Tarzan Goto and Mr. Ganasuke and Flying Kid Ichihara B. Keisuke Yamada and Hiroshi Itakura and Tommy Rich. September 27th A. Tokyo Pro Wrestling, Bill White B. Akihiko Masuda, Daiko Kubo Benkei B. Masanobu Kurisu, Shinobu Tamura and Mike Anthony B. Shocker and Astro Ray Jr., Masao Orihara B. Kishin Kawabata, Great Kabuki and Takashi Ishikawa B. Black Wasma and Shigeo Okamura, Abdullah the Butcher B. The Natural. September 27th Anomichi, Big Japan Pro Wrestling, Masahiko Kochi B. Satoru Shiga, Bruiser Okamoto B. Yosuke Kobayashi, Seiji Yamakawa and Yoshihiro Tajiri B. Dr. Wagner Jr. and Black Warrior, Kendo Nagasaki B. Axel Rotten, Barbed Wire Board Street Fight Death Match, Dances with Dudley and Mitsuhiro Matsunaga B. Shoji Nakamaki and Ichiro Yaguchi.
September 27, Matsura All Japan Women, Momoe Nakanishi B. Yashokawa Moto, Saya Endo B. Miho Wakazawa, Ri Tamada and Yumi Fukawa B. Yuka Shina and Yoshiko Tamura, Mima Shimoda and Tomoko Watanabe and Genki Misai B. Yumiko Hara and Takako Inoue and Shaparita Asari, Tashio Yamada B. Mariko Yoshida, Asia Kong and Atsuko Mita B. Manami Toyota and Kaoru Ito. September 27th, Chiba, JD, Abe B. Yano, Koyama B. Yuko Kosugi, Koyama B. Abe, Chiquita Azteca, Esther Moreno, B. Bloody Phoenix, Princessa Blanca and Lioness Asuka B. Neftali and Kuga, Miori Kamiya, Bison Kimura and Chicago Shiratori B. Jaguar Yokota and Yuki Lee. September 28th, Columbus, Ohio, WCW 3016, Jim Powers B. Juventud Guerrera, WCW Cruiserweight title, Rey Mysterio Jr. B. Dean Malenko DQ, Lex Luger B. Rick Steiner, 6, Sean Waltman, B. Eddie Guerrero, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall B. Rick Flair and Chris Benoit, Giant B. Randy Savage DQ. September 28, Tokyo Karakuen Hall, All Japan, 2100 Sellout, Tom and Honda B. Masao Inoue, Dory Funk B. Mighty Inoue, Masa Fuchi and Haruka Igen and June Izamida B. Mitsuo Momoda and Rusher Kimura and Giant Baba, Rob Van Dam and Monokia Mossman B. Kentaro Shiga and Tsuyashi Kikuchi, Stan Hansen and Bobby Duncombe Jr. B. Gary Albright and Takawamori, Kenna Kowashi and the Patriot and Giant Kimala 2 B. Steve Williams and Johnny Ace and Dan Crawford, Toshiaki Kawada and Akira Tao and Yoshinari Ogawa B. Meet Suharu Misawa and Jun Akiyama and Satoru Asako. September 28, Hakata Star Lanes, All Japan Women, 3150 Sellout, Miho Wikizawa B. Yasho Kawamoto, Genki Misae and Nana Takahashi B. Sai Endo and Momoe Nakanishi, Takako Inoue and Tomoko Watanabe and Yumi Fukawa B. Tashio Yamada and Atsuko Mita and Shaparita Asari, Kyoko Inoue B. Yoshiko Tamura, Asia Kong and Ri Tamada B. Yumiko Hara and Kumiko Makawa, WWWA Tag Titles 2 out of 3 Falls, Manami Toyota and Mima Shimoda B. Kaoru Ito, and Mariko Yoshida. September 28, Memphis, USWA Tourney for USWA Title Shot, Colorado Kid B. Crusher Bones, Flash Flanagan B. Tony Falk, Mike Samples B. Bart Sawyer, Flanagan B. Samples to win tournament, Miss Texas and Brickhouse Brown DDQ Luna Bashan and Vampire Warrior, Texas Death Match for USWA Tag Titles, Bill and Jamie Dunn D. B. Jesse James Armstrong and Wolfie D., Brian Christopher and Mark Henry B. Jerry Lawler and Scott Bowden. September 28th, Enon, IWA, June Nagaoka B. Takeshi Sato and Enimoto Kawa B. Kadoda, Mr. Niebla and Parata Morgan Jr. B. Flying Kid Ishihara and Akinori Sukioka, Katsumi Hirano B. Tutor the Turtle, Mr. Ganasuke and Ryo Mai B. Tommy Rich and Hiroshi Itakura, Tarzan Goto B. Keizo Matsuda, Leatherface and Keisuke Yamada B. Freddy Krueger and Dr. Luther. September 28th Salem, New Hampshire, IWF 400, Brian Walsh B. Tim McNeeny, Joni Lee B. Violet Flame to win IWF Women's Title, Diesel, Glenn Jacobs, B. Tony Roy, Irish Leprechaun B. Dana Carpenter, Annihilator, Jim Cody, B. Richard Byrne, King Kong Bundy and Scott Taylor B. Diesel and Bulldozer DQ. September 28th, Paulsboro NJ and WA. A. Starling B. Julio Sanchez, Himalaya Plyas B. J.R. Ryder in East LA, Derek Domino B. Don Montoya, Downward Spiral B. Bad Attitude, Rick Ratchet B. Billy Real, A. Can B. Pat Shamrock, Lost Boys B. Ralph Soto and Rasta the Voodoo Man, Reckless Youth B. Jimmy Del Rey. September 28th, Astoria, New York, IWF, Ken Sweeney B. Kodiak Bear DQ, Makumba B. 666, Jason Knight B. New Dynamite Kid, Nikolai Volkov B. Mad Dog. September 28th, Brooklyn, New York, East Coast Wrestling Association, Steve Corino B. Gino Caruso, Spanish Angel B. Johnny Gunn DQ, Gunn B. Angel, Rodney Allen and Armand B. Fabian Street and Billy Walker, Devon Dudley DDQ, Jason Knight, Jimmy Snuka B. Latin Lover, not original, Spellbinder B. Stephen Dunn, Bam Bam Bigelow B. Tatanka. September 28th, Jasper, Tennessee, Semic City Wrestling, Kevin Walker B. Mike Starr, Ken Arden B. Billy Knight, Outlaw Dennis and Billy Cooper B. Bo Black and Mr. Mark, Ken Arden B. Billy Cooper, Richie Dye B. Jeff Bowman. September 28th, Spring Place, Georgia, World Christian Federation, Johnny Quas B. Randy Rotten, Jimmy Sharp B. Chuck Colt, Outpatient B. Ninja, Scotty James and Randy Watkins B. Red Scorpion and Keith Karloff, Johnny Blaze B. Billy Montana. September 29th, New York Madison Square Garden, WWF 6, 747 thirds, 917 paid, Salvatore Sincere B. Bob Holly 1 star, Justin Bradshaw B. Alex Porto Dud, Jake Roberts B. T. L. Hopper 1 half of 1 star, 
Stalker Begoon 1 star, Owen Hart and Davy Boy Smith won four corners match over Godwins, Smoking Guns and Grim Twins to keep WWF tag titles, Lumberjack match, Vader B. Sid 2 stars, Hunter Hearst Helmsley B. Freddie Joe Floyd 1 star, Steve Austin B. Savio Vega 4 stars, IC title, Mark Marrow B. Farouk DQ Dud, Shawn Michaels and Undertaker B. Mankind and Goldust 3 and 1 half stars. September 29th Tokyo Karaku and Hall, All Japan Giant Baba 36th Anniversary Show, 2100 Sellout, Kentaro Shiga B. Yoshinobu Kanemaru, Haruka Aigen and Masa Fuchi B. Rusher Kimura and Mitsuo Momoda, Yoshinari Ogawa and Suyashi Kikuchi B. Satoru Asako and Dory Funk, Rob Van Dam and the Patriot B. Jun Izumaida and Giant Kimala 2, Ian Crawford and Bobby Duncan Jr. and Stan Hansen B. Jun Akiyama and Takao Mori and Masao Inoue, Steve Williams and Johnny Ace B. Gary Albright and Monokia Mossman, Giant Baba and Akira Tao and Toshiaki Kao to be Mitsuharu Misawa and Kenna Kobashi and Tamon Honda. September 29th Kawagoe, IWA, Katsumi Hirano B. Takeshi Sato, Emimoto Kawa B. Kadoka, Mr. Niebla and Parada Morgan Jr. B. Two to the Turtle and Jun Nagao Ka, Keizo Matsuda and Leatherface B. Freddy Krueger and Dr. Luther, Hiramichi Fuyuki B. Ryo Maik, Mr. Ganasuke and Flying Kid Ishihara B. Keisuke Yamada and Hiroshi Itakura, Tarzan Goto B. Tommy Rich. September 29th Kita Kyushu, All Japan Women, Momoe Nakanishi B. Yasho Kawamoto, Yumi Fukawa B. Miho Wakazawa, Ritamata and Yuka Shina B. Yoshiko Tamura and Saya Endo, Chaparita Asari and Kaoru Ito and Mariko Yoshida B. Genki Misae and Tomoko Watanabe and Kyoko Inoue, Mamanabe Toyota B. Atsuko Mita, Takako Inoue and Yumiko Hatabi Tashio Yamada and Asia Kong. September 29th Tateyama, Battle Earths 200, Yuki Ishikawa B. Alexander Otsuka, Minoru Tanaka B. No Hiro Hoshikawa, Katsumi Yujuta B. Satoshi Yoniyama, Hiroshi Ono and Daisuke Ikeda B. Ishikawa and Shoichi Fanaki. September 29th Liberty Ohio, IWA, Kid Thunder and Wildman B. Kid Dynamite and Cody Michaels, Batman B. Milwaukee Mahler, Greg Valentine B. Lord Zoltan, Malia Hasaka B. Debbie Combs to win Iwo Women's Title, Preston Steele B. Shiva AFI, Jimmy Snuka B. Gino Caruso. September 30th Cleveland, Ohio, WCW Monday Nitro Tapings, 4318, WCW Tag Titles, Public Enemy B. Juventud Guerrera and El Tecnico, Pete Gruner aka Billy Kidman, 1 quarter of 1 star, Alex Wright B. Dean Malenko 2 stars, Eddie Guerrero B. Jim Powers 1 and 3 quarter stars, Hugh Morris B. Brad Armstrong 1 half of 1 star, Arnold Anderson B. Chris Jericho 1 and 3 quarter stars, Lex Luger B. M. Wall Street 1 star, Mengen Barbarian B. Rock and Roll Express Dud, Chris Benoit B. Rick Steiner 3 quarters of a star. September 30th I wait UWF International, 2650, Kamigawa D. Matsui, Hiromitsu Kaneara B. Billy Scott, Tiger Mask Sayama B. Now Hiro Hoshikawa, Nikolai Gordo B. James Stone, ECW Little Guido, Yoshihiro Takayama B. Masahiro Kakihara, Kenichi Yamamoto and Yoji Andro B. Nobuiko Tata and Kazushi Sakuraba. September 30th Omiya, Big Japan Pro Wrestling, Yosuke Kobayashi B. Eagle, Ichiro Yaguchi B. Masahiko Kochi, Yuichi Taniguchi B. Satoru Shiga, Seiji Yamakawa B. Black Warrior, Yoshihiro Tajiri B. Dr. Wagner Jr., Bruiser Okamoto and Kendo Nagasaki B. Dances with Dudley and Axel Rotten. Chandelier Broken Glass Drum Cabinet Barbed Wire Baseball Bat No Rope Barbed Wire Street Fight Double Hell Death Match, Mitsuhiro Matsunaga B. Shoji Nakamaki. Special thanks to Scott Hudson, Dominic Valenti, Joe Grana, Robert Rothas, Kurt Brown, Perrin Coulson, Bill Donna, Georgian Macropolis, Danny Deese, Ken Duce, Sarah Moore, Michael Lomonsky, Steve Dr. Luchasen, Dominic Valenti, Tim Harshman, Jim Harris, Jesse Money. Japanese Television Rundown September 1st All Japan 1. Toshiaki Kawada and Akira Tao and Yoshinari Ogawa beat Satoru Asako and Masao Inoue into Kawamori when Ogawa pinned Asako with a back suplex. A nothing match, which is pretty sad considering the quality of matches at least some of these guys are used to having. 1 and 1 half star. 2. Kanakowashi and the Patriot beat Stan Hansen and Dan Crawford when Patriot pinned Crawford after a sidewalk slam in 17 minutes. Focus was Kobashi vs. Hansen to build up their singles match. Kobashi worked almost the whole match for his side, which makes it even more disappointing since this was a bad match. Hansen attacked Kobashi after the match, but it wasn't the kind of attack that would make you get all that interested in seeing a singles match. One star. EMLL. They had a second straight big crowd, 
estimated in the 9,000 range, on September 27th at Arena Mexico for a double main event with Emilio Charles Jr. beating Silver King in a hair versus hair match and Kanak retaining the UWA heavyweight title beating Miguel Perez via DQ. Charles King was said to be a three stars match with double juice and lots of near falls before Charles got the clean pin using a Hurricane Rana off the power bomb. The crowd basically cheered both men. Charles hasn't lost a hair match since 1989, a fact brought up heavily in the hype. Kanek vs. Perez was said to have been so-so with Perez having to carry Kanek, with a DQ finish when Perez hit the referee. It was announced it was Kanek's 161st title defense for whatever that is worth. After being cheered like crazy last week for his singles match against El Hijo del Santo, Negro Casas was booked on the babyface side this week without a turn teaming with Ryo de Jalisco Jr. and Lismark against Bestia Salvaje and Apollo Dantes and El Satanico on the same show. Casas was super over as a face leading chance of Technicos Technicos, working the match Technico style, and scoring a third fall win using the Scorpion Deathlock on Salvaje. For some reason, the comparisons of Casas and Ric Flair are similar in that they are often the most popular wrestler in their respective companies as heels, but somehow when they turn babyface, I guess because their style is so familiar to the fans who like them as heels, they are actually more popular as heels than when turned face. AAA Mascara de Sagrada Jr. won the Mexican Minis title from Espectrito I in Orizaba a few weeks back. There are beginning to be the obvious problems with so many of the top names spending so much time in the United States with WCW as far as being unable to use the top stars in the promotion so the house show lineups in Mexico are beginning to suffer greatly. With the Mexican economy in the toilet, even though the AAA wrestlers for the most part, with the exception of Conan who has a contract, are the lowest paid of all the wrestlers in WCW, it is still more than they make in Mexico. Conan and Antonio Pena are also at odds currently over Pena wanting to bring in and push more pretty boy type baby faces that dance like strippers, the winners, Latin lover types, including plans for a second winners and they've just brought in Babe Toscano, a Latin lover clone from Monterey. With so many of the top stars abroad, the only major show this week was September 27th in Nesawal Coyote with Heavy Metal and Jerry Estrada and Psicosis over Octagon and La Parca and Latin Lover on top when Estrada pinned Lover in the third fall with a senton off the top rope in a good match. There was an angle in the semifinal with winners and Blue Demon Jr. and Pero Abueo Jr. facing Picudo and Caras La Momia and Super Manieco. During the third fall, Caras and Picudo turned on Manieco, so apparently they are planting the seeds for Mineco to turn back face, that sure didn't last long. The other match was an inter-promotional match against Uwa, which remains barely alive and uses the same building as its main arena, with the Uwa trio of Loco Valentino and Renador and Skeletor beating Frisbee and Torero and Meicano via DQ. Lady Victoria Victoria Moreno, a Southern California native no relation to the Moreno women's wrestling family in Mexico, is now wrestling under the name Chiquitabum. Winners is going to feud with Pero Silva. The other weekend house shows were headlined by such weak matches as September 28th in Puebla with Mascara Sagrada and Mascara Sagrada Jr. and Latin Lover vs. Killer and Viano 3 and Heavy Metal, to September 28th in Hewitt Soco with Pantera vs. Jerry Estrada and basically nothing underneath that and September 29th in San Juan Pantilin with Sagrada and Aguila Solitaria and Salsero vs. Kraken and Espectro and in Picudo. All Japan. The new tour started with shows on September 28th and September 29th at Karakuen Hall. The September 29th show was the 36th anniversary of the pro wrestling debut of Giant Baba, so Baba worked the main event teaming with Toshiaki Kaoda and Akira Tao to beat Mitsuharu Misawa and Kenta Kobashi and Tamon Honda in 2835 when Tao pinned Honda with the dynamic bomb, Liger Bomb. They did an angle during the match to build up the Kobashi vs. Kaoda title match where Kobashi dropped Kaoda on his head and knocked him out. Usually it's been Kaoda dropping Kobashi on his head, but I guess since even though Kobashi is champion, is going into the title match as the underdog, they did the traditional angle in reverse. The double main on the first night of the tour saw Kaoda and Tao and Yoshinari Ogawa over Misawa and Jun Akiyama and Satoru Asako and Kobashi and the Patriot and Giant Kimala 2 over Johnny Ace and Steve Williams and Dan Crawford when surprisingly Kobashi got the pin over Ace rather than Crawford who would be the one expected to do the job in that situation normally and even more so now since this is believed to be his final tour with the company since he's probably starting with WWF after this tour. The situation here has greatly changed now when it comes to foreign morale. A few years back, the regulars here saw working for All Japan as being the best regular job in wrestling. The pay was good, you had 24 to 30 weeks off per year, and a great deal of the normal stress associated with wrestling, constant fear of being swerved and career being buried by poor booking, 
lying from the office, constant travel, really didn't exist. Those who headlined here didn't want to be anywhere else, as noted by the fact that Stan Hansen in his prime was one of the top heels and workers in the world and while he had short stints elsewhere, he never gave up Japan since he knew he had the best position around. Ditto people like Terry Gordy and Steve Williams, who as big men who could work were constantly the type of wrestlers the top American offices wanted as regulars. Anyway, it has changed in a lot of the talent sees with both WWF and WCW constantly looking for new talent, that they in most cases will use up as TV fodder but that's another story, and willing to pay well for it, combined with the fact the All Japan fans have seen everything. The booking has become stale, and the fact is that the top guys have beaten each other to death and none are what they once were, Jun Akiyama would be the lone exception, without a major infusion from a Takata, who would even then only be figured to work the big shows, things are going to get worse before they get better. September 15th TV show did a 1.4 rating. New Japan The January 4th Tokyo Dome show, which will be billed as 97 Wrestling World in Tokyo Dome, tickets go on sale on October 10th. Traditionally New Japan does in excess of $1 million the first day tickets are on sale. Prices this year are $270, $135, $90, $72, and $45. So the 20,000 upper deck tickets that have been $30 traditionally have been raised, but other seats have been lowered as well. It appears a sellout is scaled to be around $5.5 million. Apparently the Keiji Muto vs. Pedro Otavio match on September 23rd in Yokohama was said to have been one of the most horrendous matches of all time. Otavio has really gotten a bad reputation among the Brazilian fighters for being the first lazy one to sell out and do a job for a pro wrestler. Apparently all the fans knew the match was a work within the first minute since it was a terrible looking match work to look like a shoot and that Otavio tapped out from punches from the mount by Muto that were obviously pulled. There are still a lot of pro wrestlers and no doubt a lot of pro wrestling fans that think things like UFC and Valley Tudo are also worked like pro wrestling, but the key unanswered question is, how come the same guys when they do worked matches, whether they be Dan Severn, Gerard Gordeau, Pedro Otavio, Paul Verlins or whomever, it becomes obvious their worked matches that are worked to look like shoots are worked, yet their supposed work matches in shoot promotions don't look at all like works. There was a lot of second-guessing the New Japan slash WCW tournament in that they bring in all the top guys from WCW and then beat them all quickly, although because of the style differences and credibility problem in that the WCW wrestlers' offense all looks weak to Japanese fans they almost have to do so, and that none of the WCW guys even made the Final Four, Scott Norton is still considered by fans as a New Japan wrestler. The booking idea of putting Shiro Koshinaka vs. Kensuke Sasaki in the championship match and putting Sasaki over, was to elevate those two to the level of Muto, Masahiro Chono and Shinya Hashimoto and create even more parity at the top. Of the five, Sasaki is the one who needs the push the most. Still, it's hard to argue with sellouts every night. Sonny Ono was in with the WCW crew as Eric Bischoff's representative since Bischoff stayed back to do the Nitro show. Ono was supposed to manage Kurosawa, but Kurosawa didn't want him in the corner so he had no role as a performer on the tour. The main business message he carried from Bischoff regarded WCW's heat with Animal Warrior. Bischoff told New Japan that he didn't want any of his wrestlers anywhere near Animal, which meant in the ring either with him or against him. That's why the Animal and Power vs. Rick Steiner and Muto feud, which was supposed to be Road Warriors vs. Steiners but for some reason whenever that feud is supposed to take place, it falls apart was dropped in midstream and why Animal was relegated to working a singles match against Tadao Yasude, Yokohama. WCW was supposed to book all the New Japan foreign talent but I guess since Road Warriors at one time were such a big deal in Japan, they've been able to keep their jobs with New Japan even having left WCW. The angle with Big Japan continued on the September 30th Big Japan show in Omiya. Big Japan sent tickets to the New Japan office and challenged the wrestlers to appear, Instead, four members of the New Japan front office including Nagashima came to Omiya and met with Shinya Kojika, Big Japan president. While nothing was officially announced coming out of this, the belief is that this will lead to an angle with Big Japan vs. Heisei Ishigun. Next New Japan tour is the tag team tournament from October 13th to November 1st. With Norton out of action due to his shoulder injury, it is expected that Junji Hirata will reform his tag team with Hashimoto. Opening night at Karakuen Hall has Chono and Hiroyoshi Tenzon vs. Satoshi Kojima and Kurosawa Tatsumi Fujinami and Koshinaka vs. Steve Regal and David Taylor. The major cards are October 20th in Kobe with Sasaki and Rikichashu vs. Hashimoto and Hirata, 
October 23rd in Nagasaki with Fujinami and Koshinaka vs. Kazuo Yamazaki and Takashi Izuka and Chono and Tenzan vs. Regal and Taylor, October 28th in Kagoshima with Mudo and Rick Steiner vs. Chono and Tenzan, Hashimoto and Hirata vs. Regal and Taylor and October 30th in Hakata with Fujinami and Koshinaka vs. Chashu and Sasaki. Fujinami's Mug Promotion has shows on October 5th and October 7th and will be doing an undercard tournament using debuting Japanese wrestlers that Fujinami is training named Nobuyuki Karashima and Kazuhiko Shoda along with British wrestlers Shane Lisby, Darren Marones, Jesse Gira, Johnny Patrick and Darren Fletch plus New Japan's Osamu Nishimura. September 15th TV show did a 2.2 rating. Other Japan Notes it was announced on September 30th that Nobuiko Takata had agreed to work the Tokyo Pro Wrestling Show on October 8th in Osaka against Abdullah the Butcher. For obvious reasons, that's a bizarre matchup particularly since there is both a style clash as everything Butcher does would be against everything Takata does, and visa versa. Plus, how do they work out a finish? Since Uvi remains deeply in debt, Takata has basically put himself out on the indie market charging 30 million yen, $27,000, Per match, which is probably the highest per match price any wrestler in history has ever been able to get on a semi regular basis working indie, war, and Tokyo Pro dates in wrestling history. Other guys like Jim Helwig may have asked as much at times, but were never able to get anything even resembling a figure like that. This appearance by Takata creates double heat in that war had a show at the same building in Osaka on October 11th and had paid Takata the big fee as well to appear, and now basically by appearing for Tokyo Pro, which is a rival group in some ways they've undercut his value. The War Osaka show, headlined by Genichiro Tenryu vs. Great Muda in their first ever singles match, Takata and Masahito Kakihara and Yuji Sano defending the War six-man titles against Bam Bam Bigelow and Hiramichi Fuyuki and Yoji Anjo, Great Sasuke defending the eight junior titles against Ultimo Dragon and Rey Mysterio Jr. defending the WWA welterweight title against Sikosis is just about sold out anyway. The TPW owner who is a money mark named Ishizawa, was a big-time Takata slash UWF mark to begin with. Originally, TPW was attempting to bring in Tiger Jeet Singh as Butcher's mystery opponent but that deal fell through and with a hole in the card at the last minute, they went with Takata. Complete show on October 8th besides Takata Butcher is Takashi Ishikawa vs. Anjo with the winner to become president of the company doing the same interpromotional fake shoot front office angle that's pretty much become in vogue everywhere in the world right now, Tiger Mask Sayama vs. Great Kabuki which would be their first ever singles match and probably would have meant something if it was 1983, Cebu vs. Black Wasma, 2 Cold Scorpio, Yoshihiro Takayama vs. Daiko Kubo Benke, Kuga and Bloody Phoenix vs. Esther and Aldo Moreno from JD, Shigeo Okamura and Astro Ray Jr. and Takeru vs. Kishin Kawabata and Mike Anthony, Mike Lazansky, and the natural Don Callis, a wrestler from Winnipeg who looks like a young Howard Stern and does awesome interviews, although I guess neither of those things would register in Japan, Masao Orihara vs. Shocker and Shinobu Tomura vs. Kenichi Yamamoto. I believe that will be Sabu's final match with TPW as even though he's earning a rumored $6,000 per week, he believes the promotion has double-crossed him on several issues. Sabu has made inquiries about getting back into WCW so he could also get back with New Japan. Rings ran on September 25th in Sapporo and drew 3,853 fans for its final show before the Battle Dimension tournament and was filled with surprises and all the Japanese stars and top-ranked Hans Nyman all did jobs on the show. The only win by a Japanese wrestler was Mitsuya Nagai, and that's because he beat another Japanese, Tsuyoshiko Saka, which has to be a mild upset since Kosaka was coming off the two great matches against Folk Han and his stock was rising. Top pushed star Yoshihise Yamamoto suffered his third loss in a row, this time losing to a knee cross submission by Andre Kopolev in 1233. This sets up Kopolev as Akira Maeda's first opponent in the tournament that starts on October 25th in Nagoya. Bitsei's Terry will become the number one ranked wrestler according to the ratings, beating Nyman in a match for that position via KO in 519. Nyman had won the spot from Yamamoto in July. Folkhan retained his number 3 ranking beating hot newcomer Kyoshi Tamura in 1032 via submission with a reverse arm lock in the other top match. With Yamamoto having lost 3 matches in a row and having looked unimpressive in a 30 minutes decision win over Maurice Smith before losing the 3 bouts, this is either being done to set him up to win the Battle Dimension tournament or because he failed in shoot situations and this is a so-called shoot group, they feel they have to phase him down from the top. It'll be evident as the tourney goes on two months back. The main event on the October 10th Michinoku Pro Show at Sumo Hall, the biggest show in the history of the company, 
was announced as Sayama and Sasuke and Mil Mascaras vs. Dynamite Kid and Kunyaki Kobayashi, Sayama's big rival 1982-83 and Dos Cars. I believe it would be the first time Mascaras has ever wrestled his brother anywhere, but certainly the first time in Japan. They did officially announce the Hayabusa vs. Jinsei Shinzaki, Hakushi, match this past week as well. The show is going to sell out as the advance was around 9,000 two weeks out. FMW finished its tour on September 24th at Karakuin Hall before a sellout 2,150 with Terry Funk and the Gladiator beating Hayabusa and Masato Tanaka in a street fight on top. After the match, FMW created its own NWO angle, creating a new hill group called FMW, Funk Masters of Wrestling, to feud with the babyface FMW. After the match when Funk announced the creation of his hill group, Horace Boulder, the headhunters, Hisakatsu Oya and Super Leather along with hill manager Victor Quinones, the group's booker, all joined the group. So this promotion has three basic groups, regular FMW, hill FMW and the Wings Army. Mr. Pogo didn't work this tour but attended every show and would do interviews before the fans asking the fans to help him to get Atsushi Onita to come back. The actual FMW plan is to run a show on December 11th in Tokyo with Onita and Pogo as a tag team against Hayabusa and Shinzaki. Even though Funk was put in the lead position and business was very good on the tour with him as the big draw, he isn't expected back for several months and won't be back for the rest of the year. The idea is that Onita won't come back full-time, but will work maybe three or four shows in 1997 and perhaps push an Onita-Funk match at Kawasaki Stadium next year. After the final show of the tour in the hotel, Fumi Saito of Weekly Pro Wrestling Magazine got into an argument with Quinones. The two have had problems in the past, and the argument escalated from exchanging words to exchanging dirty words and Quinones got up and allegedly sucker-punched Saito in the right eye and nearly knocked him out. This wasn't an angle. FMW immediately apologized. There may be legal ramifications stemming from this. Anyway, it's the first incident that I can recall where a wrestling personality has punched a reporter, except in worked angles, since 1984, John Stossel and David Schultz. Iwa's main angle on the current tour revolves around the debut with the group of Fuyuki as a heel. Fuyuki, managed by Patricia debuted on September 26th in Osaka beating Hiroshi Itakura. Patricia distracted the referee to allow Fuyuki to win. Patricia also managed Leatherface on this tour. Leatherface lost the main event to Tarzan Goto, who after the match vowed that if Patricia continued to distract him, he was going to take scissors and cut her dress off. War announced Karako and Hall shows on October 28th and November 9th. The October 28th show will feature a six-man tag title match with Genichiro Tenryu and Ultimo Dragon and Nobutaka Araya challenging the winner of the October 11th match, which no doubt will be Bigelow and Fuyuki and Anjo since Takata's $27,000 per match price makes no economic sense in a building like Karaku and Hall where the total gross for a sellout would be $80,000-ish. November 9th is headlined by the first ever singles match with Tenryu vs. Kazuo Yamazaki, plus Jushin Liger and El Samurai defending the War International Junior Tag Titles against Lance Storm and Yuji Yasu Ryoka. All Japan women ran a semi-major event on September 28th at Hakata Star Lanes drawing a legit sellout of 3,150 as Minami Toyota and Mima Shimoda retained their WWWA Tag Titles beating Kaoru Ito and Mariko Yoshida, Toyota's regular tag partners in a best-of-three fall match which went 30-57 before Toyota pinned Yoshida with the Japanese Ocean Cyclone Suplex. The next AJW event will be the annual tag team tournament from October 13th with the finals on December 1st at Karakuen Hall. Once again they are doing the gimmick attempting to get the younger girls over and teaming a star with a younger girl. This failed at the box office in a one-night tourney in May at Karakuen Hall, and failed again for a two-night tourney at Budokan Hall in August but the company needs to keep going in this direction, as it has to build itself for its future. Teams are Asia Kong and Yoshiko Tomura Toyota, and Ri Tamata, Yumiko Hata, and Momoe Nakanishi Hyoko Inoue, and Shaparita Asari, Shimoda, and Reggie Bennett Tashio Yamada, and Saya Endo Tsuko Mita, and Genki Misae Yoshida and Eito, Takako Inoue and Yumi Fukawa and Tomoko Watanabe and Kumiko Makawa. The top four point getters in the round robin go into the so called final four on December 1st with the first place point getter versus four and two versus three, and then the winners meet for the championship. Opening night is October 13th at Karaku and Hall with Kong and Tamura versus Toyota and Tamada Hata and Nakanishi versus Takako and Fukawa, Bennett and Shimoda versus Ido and Yoshida and Mita and Misae versus Yamada and Endo. The other major shows on the tour are October 21st in Osaka, Kong and Tamura versus Maikawa and Watanabe. October 24th in Omiya, Toyota and Tamata vs. Ito and Yoshida, and November 4th back at Karakuen Hall, 
Kong and Tamura vs. Kyoko and Asari, Toyota and Tamada vs. Takako and Fukawa, Bennett and Shimoda vs. Misae and Mita and Hata and Nakanishi vs. Maikawa and Watanabe. The main JD program revolves around the return of Linus Asuka with the TWF world title. On October 6th in Kawasaki, Bison Kimura faces Kuga, Miori Kamiya, with the winner getting the first title shot on November 16th, in Osaka. Bull Nakano is leaning toward joining JD rather than Gia. Social Pro Wrestling Federation will be running a tournament from October 28th to November 7th using its wrestlers, Yoshiaki Yatsu, Isamu Taranashi Murderer and Ichiro Yaguchi, an indie, Poison Sawada, and Americans Action Jackson, Steve Cox and Rod Price. Big Japan ran another chandelier broken glass drum cabinet barbed wire baseball bat no rope barbed wire street fight double hell death match on the September 30th Omiya show with Mitsuhiro Matsunaga beating Shoji Nakamaki. Wufi ran September 30th in I Wait Before 2650 with Takata and Kazushi Sakuraba losing the main event to Anjo and Yamamoto. Sayama worked the show beating now hero Hoshikawa of Michinoku Pro while ECW's Little Guido worked as James Stone, losing to Nikolai Gordo. For whatever this is worth, the baseball magazine Shaw Martial Arts Magazine, which is the best-selling martial arts magazine in the world, when it covers shoot world performers in pro wrestling, if they believe the match is a shoot they analyzes in great details with lots of photos, and if they believe it's a work, they gloss over it quickly and give it one photo although they don't editorially differentiate saying a match at a work, it's a way for the reader to understand. Anyway, the August 24th Maurice Smith vs. Kiyoshi Tamura match got the one photo treatment, USWA. The biggest news is that Randy Hales has quit the promotion as general manager, not only just as Booker as we'd reported last week. Hales hasn't entirely quit as he's moved from Nashville back to Jonesboro, Arkansas and will run USWA shows in Arkansas towns, but is done as road manager largely over frustration with the company all the problems that anyone who has ever worked for the company ends up having. Not certain who will be taking Hales' position. Jerry Lawler is booking, but he's gone most of the time and he can't run all the shows since he won't be at most of them. Jesse James Armstrong has also left, obviously for WWF. Believe it or not, the biggest angle involves manager Scott Bowden and John Rainey, a local radio sportscaster on the all-sports station that sometimes, but not always, carries a radio broadcast of the Memphis Cards. In the September 27th main event, Bowden and Lawler lost to Mark Henry and Brian Christopher when Rainey decked Bowden which led to Henry pinning him. This sets up a match on October 3rd in Memphis with Rainey vs. Bowden billed as a boxer vs. wrestler match. The other matches on the October 3rd show are Lawler and Dundies vs. Wolfie D and Christopher and Brickhouse Brown in a stretcher match, Lawler defending the unified title against Stephen Dunn, Christopher defending the USWA title against Flash Flanagan, Tony Falk and Mike Samples vs. Bart Sawyer and Johnny Rotten and more, although not much more. With a lot of local publicity regarding Henry coming to town, they drew an estimated 1,250 fans on September 26th in Union City, Tennessee, which was more than double what the Memphis show drew, with Henry over Lawler via DQ on top. ECW Only show of the week was September 27th in Allentown, Pennsylvania before an estimated 750 was Raven beating Sandman in a cage match for the title when Stevie Richards interfered and superkicked Sandman, Sabu pinned Perry Saturn, Shane Douglas retained the TV title beating Pit Bull No. 2. New Jack won a handicap match over Blue Meanie and Richards who were dressed up like Public Enemy and called Flyboy Stevie Richards and Meanie Grunge. Mustafa missed a show for the second weekend in a row. The new tag team that were the first guys brought in from the school are called the Erotic Experience, not the Exotic Experience as reported here last week. They didn't hype the WWF feud deal heavily on television, but it was brought up with Joey Styles calling the ECW arena the most famous bingo hall in all of sports and at one point threw a punch at the camera and said, Hey Vince, bingo. Rock and Roll Express debut as heels to work against the gangsters for the tag titles probably at the October 5th Philadelphia show. The match with Dan Crawford and Doug Furness versus Rob Van Dam and Sabu aired on the television this past week. The 30 minutes match was edited down to 26 minutes. From what I'm told what they edited out was to protect Sabu, as on the TV version, you didn't see Sabu missing spots. Crawford was in a league of his own as they haven't had a mat wrestler in this promotion of that caliber since Malenko and Guerrero left. Van Dam did some great high spots but other parts of his work weren't good. Overall I'd give it in the 3 and 1 half stars range because it was more like a lucha match that wasn't top level in, it had great moves and high spots but fell apart in spots as opposed to a smooth American or Japanese style at its best level.
it certainly blew away anything WWF or WCW had on this past Monday's television. The rock band Weezer has a song getting some radio airplay with an ECW reference to grunge leg dropping new Jack through a table. Here and there. A correction from the August 19th issue. Mel Price, a House of Representatives member who was close to Sam Mushnick and apparently was a key person in Mushnick bailing the NWA out of the late 50s Justice Department investigation, was from the 12th District in Illinois and not from Missouri. Also, Bader technically was world champion on three continents, not four. Luthez called to note regarding the letter in the September 23rd issue that the difference between the Japanese book written with Koji Miyamoto and the American book with Kit Bauman is that they are two entirely different books, the Japanese book is a biography and the American book is an autobiography. We constantly get letters asking about the autobiography and the best way to get information would be to send a SACE to P.O. Box 8686, Norfolk, Virginia 23503. As mentioned before, my feeling is the book is the best book ever written about pro wrestling in English and I think it's really a shame how the book has largely been ignored outside of a few circles. Ultimate Championship Wrestling will be running a free show on October 12th at Bohemia Hall in Astoria, New York. Billy Graham underwent a six-hour hip replacement surgery on September 25th and is still hospitalized at this writing. It was a pretty serious deal, coming just eight weeks after surgery to replace the other hip, and it's expected to be a nine-month-long recovery period. Hanzo Gracie accepted the Richard Hamilton challenge for a match against Mark Coleman, saying he'd fight Coleman anytime, saying that Coleman has no technique that would make him tap. Of course that's a verbal acceptance which is a long way from a contractual acceptance. Since the two work for rival promotions, Gracie for reality superfighting and Coleman for UFC. Hamilton held up a poster after Coleman won the last UFC challenging Hickson, Boyce and Henzo Gracie all in the same night. Hamilton said they'd agree to fight under any rules and under any time limit. Henzo Gracie fights at about 165 pounds, so he'd be giving up 85 pounds. The entertainment technology magazine called Access in the August-September issue has a lengthy article about Buddy Albin's IFC show in Kiev of the Ukraine Republic. Glenn Jacobs worked as Diesel on Walter Kowalski's September 28th show in Salem, New Hampshire and got good reviews trying to do all the Diesel spots. They had advertised Isaac Yonkem being there, so fans weren't pissed off about being promised Diesel and getting another guy. AWF is running a house show on October 19th in Anoka, Minnesota with Tito Santana and Sergeant Slaughter vs. Blacktop Bully and Nails, Tom Zink vs. The Hater and Lenny Lane vs. Horace the Psychopath as the top three matches. Lay Thatcher is running a Heartland Wrestling Association show on October 12th in Lebanon, Ohio at the National Guard Armory with Ricky Morton vs. Killer Kyle and Mike Samples vs. Bobby Blaze as the double main event. If you bring an observer to the ticket window you get $1 off. For more info call 513-771-1650. All Pro Wrestling is running October 5th at their Pacific Coast Sports Gym in Hayward, California. If you mention the Wrestling Observer, you get $1 off. Since the gym holds less than 100, tickets must be reserved in advance at 510-785-8396. The group is running its biggest show to date on October 12th at Johansson High School in Modesto, California billed its Night of Champions bringing in several legends of Northern California wrestling, plus a battle royal and a tournament for both the group's heavyweight and junior heavyweight belts. Pharaoh Entertainment and IPW are putting on a Wrestlepalooza show with two rock bands plus 911 Axel Rotten, Brick Bronski, Reckless Youth and more on October 19th at the New Britain, Connecticut Sports Palace. For ticket in to call 203-365-0062. WCW. Monday Nitro on September 30th in Cleveland drew 4,318 paying $52,000 for one of the worst Nitros in history. The live crowd reacted furiously pelting the ring with garbage after the show went off the air since the matches were for the most part terrible. The television show was built around the NWO, what else is new? And they were all having a party at the hotel room so none of the NWO wrestlers, nor Ric Flair, shoulder injury, nor Sting, doing a movie, nor Randy Savage, hanging out at the hotel, appeared before the live crowd. To make things worse to the live crowd they introduced Savage for an interview and he never came out, which may be effective television for telling a story but you can imagine what it does to a crowd pissed off legitimately for about a dozen other reasons to begin with. WCW is going to attempt to alleviate the problem by buying a video wall, they rent one for PPVs right now, so at least the live crowd can see the cutaways. The NWO stuff looked like public access TV although there were a few funny lines.
Nasty Boys joined the NWO and Jerry Sags bent over and spread his cheeks, saying he was doing an impression of Eric Bischoff on last week's TV show. Bischoff walked off the set early into the second hour for no explainable reason although what Sags did may not have been planned, although there is so much swerving going on these days that you never know, and nobody seemed to know ahead of time that Bischoff was going to walk off. Between that and Savage's calling Liz a son of a bitch twice, they may be pushing the envelope themselves. They were hinting that Bischoff was going to the NWO party as a tease the rest of the show but that that was just something the announcers made up on the spot as it wasn't a storyline discussed beforehand, and he never showed up there and was never seen again the rest of the show. Elizabeth wound up at the party with a storyline that she's apparently signed an acting contract with Hogan but wants to get out of it, then Savage saw her leaving the room and freaked out with her screaming you don't understand. Now that Liz is turning face, her outfits have changed from black to white and the necklines have gone up. Let's see a bunch of guys throw you down and spray paint your nice dress, and then a few weeks later you end up in a hotel room with about nine of them alone. I can just imagine what those folks who thought Tyson was innocent were thinking of her. Once Liz turns face, her shelf life as far as being useful is about two months max although they've done about as much with her as a heel as they can. Hogan brought his son Nicholas to be on television, must be nice to have a two-hour weekly show as a personal vehicle, who is the son that was involved in the boating accident three weeks ago. Kyle Petty was also at the party and they talked about his driving the NWO car. Bischoff did a great promo to open the show saying his biggest mistake ever was bringing Hogan to WCW, which is also his biggest worked line ever. The WCW car now has a Sting face on it which supposedly is an apology from WCW to Sting for doubting him. Public Enemy kept the tag titles beating Juventud Guerrera and El Tecnico, Billy Kidman under a hood, although it surprised me it was Kidman since the guy froze in the ring and Kidman is usually a good worker, in 206. Kidman subbed at the last minute for Psychosis who didn't show up as scheduled, likely because he still doesn't have his working papers in order. P.E. should have lost the tag title before you read this as later in the show after an abysmal match where Meng and Barbarian beat Rock and Roll Express. They tried to make the save for Rock and Roll and Meng Chop blocked Grunge and they destroyed P.E. It was one of the saddest things in a long time watching Robert Gibson standing on the middle rope leading the crowd in a rock and roll chant we've seen for almost 15 years now as Morton's getting plastered and get the deaf treatment in response. P.E. was to defend the belts on October 1st in Canton, Ohio, to air on WCW Saturday night on October 5th, against Harlem Heat and no doubt the knee will spell the difference. Grunge legit was going to undergo knee surgery, that's why they did the angle to set up them feuding with faces of fear, so he'll be out a few weeks. And in typical WCW fashion, on the promo package for Havoc that aired on Raw, they listed the tag title match as Heat defending against Hall and Nash. Alex Wright upset Dean Malenko, which pretty well guarantees Malenko beating Rey Mysterio Jr. for the cruiserweight belt in Las Vegas. A weird finish saw Eddie Guerrero use the German suplex on Jim Powers, but he'll ref Nick Patrick counted three and raised Guerrero's hand as the announcers were protesting Guerrero hadn't gotten his shoulder up made Guerrero look like a heel and he seemed visibly thrilled on TV having to play along with such a dumb finish. It ended up with Nick Patrick challenging Teddy Long to be a ref, so I guess Teddy Long will go back to being a ref. Arnold Anderson pinned Chris Jericho with a DDT in 534. The booking committee in almost record time is trying to make sure Jericho, who has potential, doesn't get perceived by anyone as being able to break into the upper echelon. Main event saw Chris Benoit pin Rick Steiner in 425 when Steve McMichael used the briefcase on Rick as Deborah distracted the ref. The crowd was dead by this point and even that match, which had potential to be great, wasn't even good. Anderson and woman browbeat Liz about her sympathizing with Savage during two interviews, and she didn't come to ringside with Anderson for the match with Jericho. Nitro drew a 3.3 rating, 3.4 first hour, 3.1 seconds hour which is the biggest second hour drop in history which speaks volumes for the quality of the show, and 5.0 share. Monday Night Raw did a 2.3 rating and 3.3 share while the Nitro replay did a 1.4 rating and 3.0 share. It's the fifth consecutive week that Nitro ratings have dropped from the week before, and second straight week, and third of the last four, where there has been a major turnoff factor as the show goes on. Still, I'm sure the company would be thrilled with averaging a 3.3 for the year. What we get is that Bischoff recognized just how bad a show it was. Other weekend numbers saw main event do a 1.4, Saturday night a 2.5 and pro a 1.3. Flair worked the weekend house shows. Well, actually, he appeared at the shows. In both Columbus, Ohio, 3,016 paying $40,572, 
and Steubenville, Ohio 1,500 paying $20,320, he and Benoit wrestled Hall and Nash. Six hit the ring and Benoit chased him to the back, allowing Hall and Nash to double-team Flair, who never got his robe off. Benoit came back and worked the entire match, such as it was, since it went less than five minutes each night, by himself and ended up being pinned, when Six interfered. Flair saw Dr. Jim Andrews, the noted surgeon in Birmingham, on Monday afternoon, and he recommended surgery on the shoulder which, if Flair does it, would keep him out of action at least a few weeks or probably at least until the pay-per-view show. Flair vs. Savage was scheduled to headline most of the house shows over the next few weeks, so they may change them to triangle matches with Sting, Savage, and Giant. Report from the Columbus show was very negative. Only Mysterio Jr. vs. Malenko, which had a cheap DQ finish when Dean threw the ref in the way of a Mysterio Jr. dropkick, had their working shoes on and they had a great match. Herrera job for Jim Powers. Lex Luger pinned Rick Steiner in a match described as terrible as both appeared to be major jet lagged. Six pinned Eddie Guerrero in what was described as a disappointing one sided almost squash. The combined time of the two main events, which were the flare match and the Giant vs. Savage, Savage DQ'd in 3.30 for hitting Giant with a chair, was less than seven minutes. Sting's storyline is actually to explain his absence as he's doing a movie called Liar, Liar starring Jim Carrey. I can think of a lot of wrestling personalities who should be stars in a movie with that name. The working plan for the NWO TV show is that they'll do the Saturday night two-hour show every other week starting in November or December. This past weekend Saturday night show was taped September 25th in Montgomery, Alabama before 4,100, 1,800 paying $18,000. Public Enemy kept tag titles beating highly ranked contenders high voltage, Malenko beat Brad Armstrong and afterwards Malenko did an angle where he clotheslined Mysterio Jr. and took his mask off. The way they shot the angle made Mysterio Jr. look to be only 5 feet tall. Then again that's about what he is, but they really exposed his lack of size by not taking care in how the angle was shot as Tony Schiavone looked like Andre the Giant next to him. Just in case people haven't gotten the clue that Jericho is a jobber, he teamed with Powers and lost to that awesome combination of Dick Slater and Mike Enos. Herrera did a squash in one minutes for Luger. They had tryouts for Colorado Crusader, not good, Scott Vick and Big Sexy who showed some potential, and Hog Higgins, who looked terrible and may have been former Texas jobber Hacksaw Larry Higgins as he was said to have looked older than Killer Brooks. J.J. Dillon started working in the office on Tuesday. Bischoff had a pep talk before the September 23rd Nitro with the wrestlers saying he wanted to beat McMahon by 1.5 again. He told the wrestlers that Dillon would be coming in and apologized to Kevin Sullivan, saying Dylan would be his assistant because he's heard Dylan is a good organizer and said that he was apologizing because it was the first chance he had gotten to tell Sullivan about this. Ironically, this Dylan deal was probably a done deal a long time ago because one major WCW figure was bragging back in late April about how Dylan was coming in, and Dylan had his house in Connecticut for sale for several months and quit with no notice when the house closed. With the exception of Mysterio Jr., who works house shows this weekend, the rest of the Mexicans aren't due back until October 24th in Stockton. Super Colo will be out for about another month. Some demographic notes on the September 23rd Nitro and Raw. The NWO segment, despite it being entertaining to many, was a ratings turnoff. When they did the takeover Nitro had risen to a 4.1 rating and the following quarters dropped to 3.7, 3.1 and 3.2 which is another huge drop the second straight huge drop when WCW did an NWO angle in the second hour. Those viewers that left for the most part didn't turn to Raw, which did 2.0, 1.8, 2.0 and 2.4 quarters. It's clear that the company desperately needs to do two things wipe out the NWO stings, though that just WWF and not pro wrestling in general gets painted with the same brush by fans tired of bogus performers, and do an angle that makes the WCW slash NWO angle not look like a 73-0 shutout as fans are tuning out every week when the angles hit as opposed to the angles being the turn on when NWO first came on the scene. The positive note about the September 23rd show, which also translates into the NWO taking over, is that it was the first show where WCW beat WWF in teenage viewers head-to-head. -head. WCW had a 65-35 to 35 edge in adults which is about the usual margin. Before the NWO angle started, WCW started the show with a 69-31 to 31 edge, and WWF had a 53-47 to 47 edge in 211S, also the usual margin. WWF usually has about a 55 to 45 edge in teens, but with Michaels and Undertaker off the show and NWO on, the edge was WCW's by a huge 66 to 34 margin, or nearly 2 to 1. 
all those margins would have been far bigger had they not done the NWO takeover. During the first 30 minutes of the NWO takeover, WCW lost 33% of its adult viewership, 27% of its kids and even 16% of its teenagers, and none of those groups switched to Raw. WWF In his first major act as co-CEO, Neville Meyer fired five vice presidents Osbert de Arce, senior vice president of Worldwide Properties, Lee Barso, vice president of New Media who headed the America Online Division, Chris Burt, head of the merchandising department, Ed DeLong head of international licensing, and Bob Mitchell, vice president of publications and who worked with Barstow doing the America Online division. Barstow and Mitchell were both involved in that America Online censorship fiasco a few weeks back. The belief internally is that Meyer wants to restructure those divisions and bring in his own people, although when Meyer first was hired, the word from former company employees was to expect some front office people to get the access he'd basically be hired to do the dirty work. Anyway, all those positions are expected to be filled shortly, while the J.J. Dillon position isn't going to be filled. Dillon's duties will be divided up with Linda McMahon handling contract negotiations with talent, Jerry Briscoe and Jim Ross working as office liaisons with the talent, Ross handling personal appearances and Bruce Pritchard handling the rest of talent coordination. Brian James, Rhodey, will be using the ring name Jesse Jamis, that's J-E-S-S-E-E, J-A-Me-E-S-S, as the new double J with bleached blonde hair. Sometimes I think the buried alive concept on the next pay-per-view is apropos for the entire promotion when you see things like this, the new Razor and the new Diesel. Dan Crawford and Doug Furness are expected to debut in November. The two haven't signed contracts, but had a meeting at Titan on September 16th and both were offered contracts presumably to work against Owen Hart and Davey Boy Smith for the tag team titles. They would be giving up all Japan for this deal. In an interesting twist, WCW, which they were first planning on going to since Furnace was broken into wrestling by Kevin Sullivan, was given a chance to meet the Titan offer and didn't do so, so as always seems to happen in this business, a measure of complacency may be beginning to set in with a group that is perceived to be on top. Terry Gordy did a tryout match without a mask putting over Savio Vega at the September 24th Superstars tapings in State College, Pennsylvania. He was said to have looked so-so. Other notes from the show which drew 3189 paying $50,277 were Shawn Michaels over Justin Bradshaw, New Diesel over Aldo Montoya Godwins over Harden Smith in a non-title match, Farouk over Jake Roberts, Salvatore Sincere upset Savio Vega when Austin interfered to heat up their match on the next pay-per-view. They did an interview where Farouk and Sonny had an amicable split since Sonny is being taken off the road, both to do the live wire every Saturday morning, and also, with Skip no longer on the road, Sonny was getting heat with a lot of people. In the interview they tried to throw in a faint illusion that the two may be doing each other for that famous black male-slash-white female stereotype, heat, that gets done over and over in wrestling to appeal to some sort of prejudices yet never seems to click with a public that appears to be generally not as prejudiced when it comes to interracial relationships in 1996 as wrestling promoters believe them to be. Without Sonny around, Baruch is going to need all the help he can get. Other house shows this week saw September 25th in Danville, Pennsylvania draw 860 fans and $14,619. September 26th in Saginaw, Michigan drew 3,753 and $50,058. September 27th at Joe Louis Arena in Detroit drew 4,847 and $83,810. September 28th in Pittsburgh Civic Arena drew 4,990 and $88,274 and MSG on September 29th ended the tour. Much of the talent in the office was included on either the Jim Ross or the ECW angles. Virtually nobody knew the Ross angle ahead of time including announcer Kevin Kelly, whose reaction on air was legit. They clued Jerry Lawler in to make sure he wouldn't react as a heel which would kill the fake shoot aspect of the angle, but a lot of the talent didn't know what was going on, although if you saw the TV, you could see the past two weeks that a Ross Hill turn looked to be the end result. Bruce Pritchard and Vega were told about the ECW angle since they were directly involved, and I'm sure much if not all the ECW talent knew, but the WWF talent didn't know beforehand on the first night, obviously they had figured it out when they did the same thing the second night. ECW Angle was talked about on Live Wire, where a caller asked out ECW and Jim Cornette joked about them running shows in a bingo hall, but not on the other shows. Most of the TV was built around the Ross vs. McMahon feud. Ross is trying to maintain his credibility as an announcer calling things straight while still portraying the lead heel persona. It's weird to say the least. On Live Wire, they made sure that everyone knew Ross was the heel in this scenario, portraying him as a postal worker who went bananas one day. 
on Superstars, Ross mainly did straight commentary although he threw in a few barbs at McMahon. On Raw when they showed a photo of McMahon, Ross called it his America's Most Wanted Photo. He asked on Superstars if McMahon will show up on Live Wire, October 5th, in a sleeveless shirt so we can see his biceps and triceps and if anyone will ask him how he got them. Yet on Raw, he still talked to Bret Hart as being his friend. He said he brought in real athletes to play Razor and Diesel and it wasn't a billionaire Ted skit like McMahon came up with to make fun of people who are more successful than he is. That last line was a surprise because it was almost an acknowledgement on the air on a WWF show that WCW has surpassed them, even though in pay-per-view the two sides are fairly even, WWF still has a huge lead in house shows, international presence and merchandising, and the only category WCW has a real edge in is television viewership, and quite frankly, in years past, there have been numerous periods WCW drew better cable ratings than WWF, although never at the current level of disparity, and nobody in those days talked of WCW as being the number one group. WWF and Dennis Coraluzzo had worked out a talent agreement where Coraluzzo would use the WWF talent that needed seasoning like Dwayne Johnson, Mark Henry, Aheem Albrecht, etc. to give them experience, but that has already fallen through due to the ECW angle. Lawler's drawing of Bill Clinton in a wrestling ring duking it out with Bob Dole is on the cover of the October issue of Comedy Magazine, they also have a feature on Lawler talking about his 1982 feud against Andy Kaufman. Speaking of Lawler, Eric Bischoff on Prodigy made these comments regarding Lawler telling people not to buy tickets to the WCW Nitro taping on October 14th in Memphis. I think Jerry Lawler exposed himself quite a bit with that little stunt. Jerry Lawler, in my opinion, is a small-time, going-nowhere individual who is probably at the end of a kind of professional career he may have had. Perhaps his bitterness is showing through. Then again, Jerry Lawler owns half of a promotion that is lucky to draw 150 people to an event at a flea market, so I can understand why he'd be bitter. Jim Neidhart is apparently gone. They are doing a lot better job of hyping the October 20th pay-per-view show even with getting the other television storylines over as compared with a lack of push for the September 22nd show. They were hyping that McMahon and Ross would both do commentary on that pay-per-view, attempting to use that as a selling point of the show since McMahon vs. Ross is being pushed as the biggest feud in the promotion. Helmsley challenged Mr. Perfect on the Raw show in the commentary, and boy does Helmsley need work on carrying his accent and believably delivering lines through more than one sentence. Rick Bogner looked real green in his TV match with Vega. It only makes a bad gimmick worse when the guy doing it looks green. The tag match with Vader and Cornette, Cornette will only manage Vader and rarely go on the road, versus Michaels and Jose Lothario was a very good match, far and away the best wrestling on Monday night television, since Vader and Michaels worked virtually the entire match and Vader scored a clean pin with the Vader bomb to set up more title matches down the road. They didn't acknowledge in the commentary, you could see it out of the corner of the screen, that Lothario chased Cornette to the back right before the finish. Besides Raw, other weekend ratings saw Blastoff doing 0.5, Livewire a 1.0 and Superstars a 1.7. If the ratings don't increase on Livewire with McMahon on his guest, it would be a very bad sign for the show. The second Livewire was said to have been better than the first. It was pretty clear they aren't using fake callers as nearly every caller froze which made for a clumsy show, and one caller snuck in a reference to the NWO and Hulk Hogan which Todd Pitingle overreacted to. I don't doubt they use real faxes and email questions, although the email from someone named Wade who said that Vince McMahon was his hero seemed rather curious but their choices of questions and comments to use, all basically being storyline and pro whatever babyface position they are trying to push, made the show get pretty redundant and totally predictable. On television, Lou Albano talked about being inducted into the WWF Hall of Fame and mentioned Baron Mikkel Shikluna, the Valiant Brothers and Killer Kowalski, who he mentioned twice, probably because he was twice as big a star as the others he mentioned. The next day at MSG, the names announced besides Albano were Pat Patterson, Valiance, and Jimmy Snuka. The Reader's Pages TV Business Regarding the AWF, a mark or a very smart man to quote Tommy Rich, pays $4 to $5 million for good television stations in mostly bad time periods to produce one television show with aging wrestlers. The one-hour show will do no better than a 1.0 rating. The spots will end up at $2,000 to $7,500 max, if they can average $5,000, and that's optimistic, 52 weeks of programming might gross $3.64 million. The 25% agency cut in all Americans commission leaves $2.73 million. You don't need Ross Perot graphs to see the problem with the bottom line. 
logically AWF bails out in the middle, stiff stations on pay, and pro wrestling is hurt once again. Regarding ECW, it's often quite good featuring some talented performers. It's always rude, infantile, and sophomoric. Either they have to change the show or they'll make no inroads on free TV. The V chip looms on the horizon. The good news in wrestling is the house shows are picking up and the boys are getting work. More real talent is needed. Fans need more of an education to lucha libre. The bad news is too much WCW hotshotting, so so pay per view by rates and too little suspension of disbelief and drama. My guess is growth for USWA and ECW over the next year, crash and burn for AWF, a new distributor for WCW and WWF. In short, it should be an interesting year. Recommendations I get to see bits and pieces of various small promotions like Windy City, IWF, Nawa, Century. It's often tough viewing, but I keep watching because these guys are helping to keep the industry alive. More specific coverage by you would help. Last, a plea to smart fans. Shut up. Don't screw up the live shows. Enjoy what you know but respect the business. That's really being smart. Bill Barons. President, SBI. Ramon Diesel. Shouldn't the Ramon slash Diesel angle weaken the WWF's lawsuit regarding misleading the public? If anything, the angle should help WCW prove the entire wrestling business is a work and none of it should be taken seriously by rational people. Kevin Hanser. Edina, Minnesota. UFC. A few weeks ago you printed a letter of mine where I suggested Semaphore Entertainment Group could build up a fight between Ken Shamrock and Bart Valley as a revenge match, since Valley held a victory over Shamrock. My intent was not to imply that it was a legitimate shoot win, but since neither party has ever pointed out that it wasn't a legitimate match and the win is used in every Valley bio ever printed, I believe Semaphore Entertainment Group would go along with the ruse and use it for build-up purposes. For Ultimate 11, maybe for the first time ever, a thumbs down. I believe the event has been slowly deteriorating since the Ultimate Ultimate. The advent of most competitors wearing gloves and more and more bloated wrestlers and brawlers involved has led to a digression in skill level. The only technique we see now is takedown and mauling. In my letter after UFC 9, I said I thought Don Fry was overrated as an all-around fighter. In UFC X, I believe he exposed his weakness at finishing and punched himself out in his first fight against Mark Hall, since he didn't even attempt to apply any kind of submission hold and instead attempted to batter his opponent into submission instead. Sadly this seems to be the same method employed by the majority of fighter semaphore entertainment group is now bringing in. The end result is UFC is beginning to resemble the cockfights their detractors say they are. The best match was the slugfest between the fat brawlers, Tank Abbott and Scott Ferrozo. Tape of this match can be provided as evidence against any argument this is athletic competition. Unfortunately the once again humiliated and overrated Abbott has already been booked to serve as fodder for a truly skilled fighter at the Ultimate Ultimate 96. Hopefully Ken Shamrock will get a chance to make good on his promise in his interview, which was the highlight of the show, and destroy the myth of Tank once and for all so we won't have to see this obnoxious pig given a form to express his psychotic and borderline criminal views any longer. Second best was Jerry Bolander vs Fabio Gurgle. I believe Gurgle would have probably won had there been no time limit. If it was a fight to the finish, would Bolander have expended energy on a fence that is at best deceptive looking in his effectiveness or would he have conserved it in an attempt to work for a finisher? I realize this is all moot since these are no longer the rules this game is played under, but the concept of who is really the ultimate fighter then is no longer really the issue. The worst bout is a tie between any of the continuing mismatches that took place in the first round. It's amazing that after all this time, Semaphore Entertainment Group has no concept of TV production and pacing of a show. With all the money these events make, couldn't we see a professional-looking fighter profile put together for once? How can they not be prepared to go to features or even to show the complete alternate matches during these frequent interminable lulls in the show? As for the less of every alternate to injury, my feeling in this case is if a competitor is too injured to go on after he wins, especially in the case of a decision, I'd like to see the loser get a shot at redemption that night if nobody else is available. I certainly would have preferred seeing Gurgle get a shot against Coleman rather than Coleman simply being awarded the title. Here is what I think the ultimate ultimate seedings should be. 1. Dan Severn 2. Hoist Gracie, 3. Ken Shamrock, 4. Oleg Toktorov, 5. Marco Ruiz, 6. Mark Coleman, 7. Don Fry, 8. Tank Abbott. First round matches would include two rematches from the last Ultimate Ultimate, Severn vs. Abbott, Toktorov vs. Ruiz, plus two new intriguing matchups. Also, I have no arguments with your Hall of Fame selections, 
except that Moulin should have been a no-brainer, and Edward Carpentier's win over Luthez was really the catalyst for the formation of the AWA and WWA and set the model for the splintering of the WWWF. That combined with his other credentials should have been enough to get him in. Only because a friend and I have been wondering about this since childhood, was Bob Freed the Madison Square Garden ring announcer during the frequently repeated Waldo von Erich vs. Bruno Sammartino match when Bruno wrestled with a broken arm? I believe this is on Bruno's greatest sports legends appearance. Bert Torelli. Fort Lee, New Jersey. Response from Dave Meltzer, whether Semaphore Entertainment Group would go along with the ruse, which I don't believe they would, is a moot point since Valley would never agree to fight Shamrock in a legit match. As for the ultimate ultimate seedings, it's best to forget about Hoist Gracie in UFC. He isn't going to do it, and even if he did, he couldn't beat the top guys in there today. As for Bolander Gurgle, if in a boxing championship match, one boxer knowing full well he can't knock the other out, outboxes the other through 85% of the match and wins via clear-cut decision, boxing aficionados don't go running around saying he never went for a knockout punch, and if there had been no limit to rounds they wouldn't have won and because of that the guy who holds the championship has no finishing skills, isn't really a good boxer or a worthy champion. Albrecht. Aim Albrecht as a wrestler raises a lot of questions regarding Titan's drug testing program. Even throwing out the drug issue, there's the question of what he'll look like after being on the road for a while. Bodybuilding doesn't mix well with other sports during the best of times, let alone in a sport where people spend so much time on the road. It's hard enough at home to eat well and get enough sleep. The only way I can see him as a draw would be with fans who read Weeder magazines. And what will they think when he doesn't look as big, hard or cut anymore? I don't even want to think about what his work will be like. Let's hone this isn't a return to the bad old days. Christopher Mowbray. Grace Danes, New South Wales, Australia. Response from Dave Meltzer, you don't get to today's professional ranks of bodybuilding without being both a genetic freak, and without tons of drugs. However, even taking away the drugs, if we go under the assumption that'll be the case, and putting the guy on the road, he's still a genetic freak and his physique will be as impressive as any physique in the history of wrestling off steroids. He won't draw with bodybuilding fans whether juiced up or not, so it hardly matters if he doesn't look as big, hard or cut as he looked while in bodybuilding competition. But like with Jim Helwig and others who are given pushes in a work sport that espouses to be anti-steroids, the message is still totally hypocritical. Hall of Fame Tag teams seem to be missing from your Hall of Fame list. Here are a few suggestions. The 1980s produced several innovative tag teams like the Midnight Express, Fabulous Ones and Rock and Roll Express. They all drew and were influential. How about the Freebirds? They were top draws and influenced the business with their use of entrance music. The recent Nitros were probably the best wrestling television programs in a long time. Whatever the WWF is doing with Jim Cornette and Jose Lothario, and it may be well done, pales in comparison to the NWO angle. All the readers that have bashed WCW over every little thing should give them the credit they deserve. There is a great shoot angle on top, wrestlers like Chris Benoit and Dean Malenko have solid programs, and excellent workers like Steve Regal and Rey Mysterio Jr. have belts. What more could they want? Ian Goodwin, Brooklyn, New York. Hall of Fame considerations. Spiros Arion, both as a villain and a hero, played both roles well. Dr. Jerry Graham, in his day he could really play a crowd. Ricky Starr, brought ballet to wrestling. Jimmy Snuka, one of the first wrestlers to use the top rope. Fuzzy Cupid and Little Beaver, two of the best midgets. Ivan Koloff, Bob Orton, an underrated performer. Carlos Colon, Puerto Rico's biggest star. Fabulous Moolah, Long Career, John Tolos, Successful Throughout the United States, Harry Von Eric, The King of Texas Wrestling. Victor Mather II. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. The Hall of Fame list was amazingly well thought out. However, I was shocked that you failed to include Chigusa Nagayo or the Crush Gals as a tag team. I'm pretty sure she meets the established parameters, and that she deserves recognition ahead of Devil Masami, taking nothing away from Masami, of course. Frank Strom. Revere, Massachusetts. Response from Dave Meltzer, Chibusa Nagio is in her 14th year as a pro, since she didn't wrestle from 1989 to 93, and is 31 years old so by our standards, wouldn't be eligible for one more year at which point I'd think she should be a lock. Linus Asuka is in her 13th year as a pro and is 32 or 33 years old so wouldn't be eligible until night. This is the end of this conversion. Be sure to comment and subscribe. See you next time.